this reading comes out of the reading that we did last year, which uh, was phenomenal, in which uh, Mr. Junkins read with Mr. H.R. Stoneback over there and Rosanna Warren. And then the idea for this poetry reading came out to, well, we brought them all three in to read together and why not feature each one of them. And so uh, Mr. Junkins agreed to read for us today. And then Mr. Stoneback has already agreed to read for us in the fall. If you remember, <laughs> and maybe we can even coax, uh, maybe we can even coax Rosanna to come back. Um, last time I kind of dealt with more formal introductions for the poets, and this time I guess I wanted to speak a little bit more from the heart in introducing Mr. Junkins. And the best way for me to do that is just to say that when I was working on my masters at New Paltz, I remember going to poetry readings and just kind of being disgusted, and then I just stopped writing because I just said, I just really just don't want to be a part of this, and, uh, and I kind of felt like, I don't know, it took a, just kind of like a, a little bit of a wandering through the wilderness, and I remember all of a sudden there was this reading, we had just come back from Kentucky, and there was kind of this murmur about this crazy guy named Donald Junkins coming to the uh, campus, and these stories started to circulate around campus about, about his reading. And I was very fascinated, and I went to the reading, and that's pretty much when I started writing again. And, uh, and I would say this is why. I think it's summarized well by, um, we're going to feature tonight the Cleveland Avenue poem, which is a little cycle of nine poems that he wrote, which a lot of you have read through with me. And in that cycle, there's, um, I think there's a, a close-knit with J.D. Salinger, and, and appropriately, we moved from the Cleveland Avenue poems to J.D. Salinger's Franny and Zoe. And in Franny and Zoe... And in 1933, uh, I'm two, and uh, late Monday morning, I cruised the yard tied to the clothesline. My heart string nagging me, I'm two, on a hot May day, a little pronoun waiting for the turnover lady. My first memory, yard time. In my green wool sweater, why won't she lift it off? My mother, hums, and I couldn't read the word. My mother hums, my mother sang all the time. Um, it was the time when women did stay home, uh, and men went to work. And they did, and they cleaned the house. And she, that's all I can remember my mother doing was cleaning the house and cooking and stuff. But she sang all the time. She sang hymns. She, she, was, she was like that Johnny Cash song that was playing when I came into the room tonight. Um, and she sang all the time, and it was a lovely thing. And and in that, and she would have the radio going, and the radio would, would all be soap operas. They lasted for 15 minutes. And each one of them was introduced by some great classical song. And so the only classics that I ever heard, music-wise, were the ones that I heard on the soap operas that were introducing uh, Backstage Mary, Backstage Mary Noble, Backstage Wife, or uh, Portia Faces Life, or Young Doctor Malone, or, you know, whatever. And um, anyway, my mother is humming here. My mother hums behind the screen door. Over there, her blue irises bathe in the sun. The yellow clapboards weave behind them in the dazzle. I trapes behind the lilies of the valley and the lilac tree. She's inside whistling before the stove cooking on her goose. She calls. The turnover lady's coming today. And at high noon, the black auto stops. A lady carries a flat square box in her arms. She's walking up the driveway. Everything disappears under the noonday sun. Every night, it was across from Ray Mason's house, and he and Ralph Romano would prepare the places they'd water down the horseshoe courts, and they'd come from all over the hill to play. 
the summer evening, this was in the late 30s, this is just before the war, right. before these boys went off to war. The summer evening hung over our heads like warm, damp clothes. The gardens were in, the news was on, the war. And that single black fin lounging across the sea green summer evening light. Supper was over. My father sat beside himself on the porch thinking of trenches, of the Marne. I walked up Cleveland Avenue to the Mesa's barn, lifted the horseshoes from the 12 penny nail. The moist yellow evening light dripped through the apple leaves and the lot across from old Leander's house, where they built the horseshoe court. Ray doused the dirt clay black, and Ralphie raked. We packed it in like a colony of ants in lockstep. The whole neighborhood was there for something to do, two against two, before the other boys went off to war, the silver shoes against the gold. Dickie Mace planted one foot against the front board of the state box and underhanded that horseshoe as if he were pitching fast softball. The shoe turned once, a perfect upside-down loop, clanged against the stake in the open U and bounced back three inches dead in front of the iron pipe. Dickie said, shit, and aimed the second shoe. He held it with both hands, arms outstretched, peering one eye through the open prongs as if he were a slingshot. Everything was at stake. It all added up to 21. The second shoe dropped a thousand times and won some points and lost some. Was it the silver or the gold? The color had worn off even then. We had light on our hands two hours before dark. We took our time and tossed it back and forth. And that old limelight style wagged the tail, even among brothers. Ray May stood outside the stake box and let the shoe go on the upward swing of his forearm, turning his wrist ever so slightly, turning, letting go of the shoe for a two and a half turn opening as it approached the stake, turning a little, hooking on, iron grabbing iron, huh, five ringers in a row. Ray Mace, the champion. Al Rippon walked up from his house at the cheering, and Ralphie Romano, my partner, squat Ralphie, sweet, tough Ralphie, who cursed the green sun when he missed and lifted his finger in obscene display and stamped his foot. Rumble Stiltskin Romano. When the green sun set and the apple leaves turned black and blue by Ribbon's garage and we couldn't tell the stake from the backboard, we milled around to tell stories under the black maples and then walked home under the moist green stars. Charlie Mace died in Africa in 1943. After the war, Dickie married Marie. They lived in the remodeled barn. Nobody came to play horseshoes in the evening. And after the ninth baby, Dickie ran away. We too have all run away in the dark. Someone built a house on the horseshoe court 30 years ago. Cleveland Avenue is quiet now. Two more wars have crowded out the fields. Whatever was at stake takes back that summer's evening and those cheers.